Hey, church, welcome. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 4. Peter and the apostles are making the church known in Jerusalem not long after Jesus has ascended to heaven. And in chapter 4, verse 11, we read this. This is Peter speaking. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This service has one central theme in the worship and the teaching, and that's that Jesus is the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. Just this last week, um, I was thinking about uh, Christ and his teachings, and I was just made grateful again for the simple reality that through all of life's twists and turns and ups and downs, um, through emotional highs and emotional lows, if you were to really pin me down and ask me, well, are you on, are you on a pathway to return to the Father, or are you on a pathway of your own destruction? I would say, I am on a pathway to the Father because I know Jesus, and I know Jesus redeems my mistakes. He celebrates my victories. He forgives my sins, and he leads me in paths of righteousness. I'm a complicated person. If you know me, that is a true statement. But man, I love knowing that if I'm following Jesus, I'm walking towards heaven. I'm walking towards eternity with him. Let us put on a garment of praise and celebration and honor our Lord Jesus with these songs. Amen? Here we go. Open wide, blinded eyes, giants fall, dead men rise, sickness healed at the mansion. chains breaking free miracles still happening waters part i see mountains move no other 
of sin that was mine washing my river of wrongs into the sea of your infinite Thank you, Chad and Erica. Wonderful as always. Nice being couch people, I'll tell you that's for sure. Hey, my name is Josh. I have a couple of announcements for you guys today. First of all, if there's anything that we could be praying for you for this week, we would love to pray for you. Go ahead and text prayer request to 97,000. Please do it even right now. That'd be really cool. We would love to pray for you this week. So a couple things going on. First, for the ladies. Ladies, you have a women's hike coming up this Saturday. This Saturday, February 27th, 
over at Palo Comado Canyon. Good pronunciation, I know. 8 a.m., just a chance for the ladies to get together, hike, hang out, really great time. It's over in Oak Park if you didn't know where that place was. Hope to see you there. Gentlemen, you can mark your calendars. The men's breakfast is coming up in about a month on Saturday, March 20th. It's a really great day. You should come check it out. That's 8.30 a.m. for the dudes. Then the week after that, after the men's breakfast, we're already starting Easter stuff. Our extravaganza is Saturday, March 27th at 9.30 a.m. There's going to be the regular egg hunt, all that good stuff, and a petting zoo. So mark your calendars for that. Excited to see you guys out for that. And then the rest of the Easter festivities take place that following weekend right after that. We've got Good Friday on April 2nd and then Easter Sunday on April 4th. Good Friday is going to be at 7 p.m. Easter, we've got three services in the morning. Excited to see you guys there. Hey, thank you so much for continuing to support ABF financially. You can give online or mail in a check. We love you guys. Thank you. Hey, you excited to get into God's Word today? Because here is Pastor Scott. Well, thanks, Josh, and uh, thank you, worship team, for leading us another week to be together in God's Word and a chance to worship together. I'm so thankful for each of you faithfully staying consistent with this, and hopefully it's an encouragement uh, to you. Just to give you a little heads up, as we're leading uh, towards Easter, uh, I'm wanting to uh, try to move through some of the sections a, a little bit faster in the sense of we're covering a chapter a week. And so won't necessarily get to cover every verse, although we'll cover the majority of the verses, really hitting on some of the bigger themes as it's so hard to uh, touch on so much great stuff in the uh, in the gospel account. And so I encourage you, even in your own devotional time, you don't have to wonder where we're going to be next week, because if it were in chapter 14 this week, where would we be next week? Nice, nice. There's some mathematicians up here, but you'll notice what we've titled this week's message, called it Distraction Free. Distraction Free. For us, uh, many of us, that sounds like an amazing thing. I've glanced at my phone three or four times just writing this intro, if I'm honest. There's so many competing things for our, at our attention, whether it's calls, texts, emails, Messenger, new updates, YouTube notifications, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. You can add to the list. There's so many things competing for our attention. Am I the only one that struggles with this? Please tell me somebody else does struggle with some distractions in their life. I've noticed, though, what happens is this environment leaves us really lacking any kind of focus, it leaves us a bit disoriented. I would say, even the negative side of it, it leaves us prone to fear, anxiety. And even when you're looking and going into digging into some of the different social media stuff, it leaves you a little bit annoyed and frustrated with the world around us. So I'm so thankful that Jesus does back then and now what's so important for us is he gets us back focused on the right thing. In the account where we're at in the life of Jesus, this is just before the chaos is about to begin, begin of his betrayal, his arrest, his torture, his false conviction, and ultimately his murder. So he's wanting to redirect the focus for the disciples on the main thing. Really, if you think about it, simplification can be the best defense for distraction. We need a, a simple focus. He's inviting them back to where they're headed, how to get there, and the helper we have been given. Exactly what was needed then and exactly what we still need today. Let me pray before we dive into today's text. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this chance to be together, to gather around your word. Lord, we invite you to speak through this text for you to be present and moving and active like only you can. So God, we turn over this time, and even as I talk about being free of distraction, we ask for that gift, even for this next half an hour, that we'd be free of distraction, be able to really enter in and, and seek you for what you want to say to us here today. We invite that now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 
So starting in chapter 14 with verse uh, one, it says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may, all, may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. We'll pause there. We'll ignore the, the chapter break because it's really a, a continued conversation from last week. If you remember, it's an encouragement for the bad news that he had just shared with his closest followers. One piece of the bad news was that one of them was going to betray him. Judas obviously left the gathering and now he's left with the other disciples. And then he shared about Peter, the hero of the group, had a pending denial before the rooster would crow. So I would suggest that they were needing a bit of encouragement so they weren't overwhelmed with hopelessness. So these are the words of encouragement that he gives. Some of us could use these words present day. Basically what he suggests, the hope that he proposes, really the solution for a troubled heart is belief. Sometimes when you read sections like this, what, what is he referring to? Is it, is it saving belief? If you think about it, they already would have had that. So what is it belief in? I would suggest, based on the topic that he's bringing up, it's belief in the goodness of God. It's easy for us in the midst of chaos and distraction to get uh, a sidetracked and forget how good our God is and the plans in which he has for you represent that goodness. Here he goes straight into the fact that he's making a place for you. He's saying the best way to deal with the chaos that you're about to enter into is to look ahead, look forward as to what's to come rather than where you're currently at. Confession as a pastor that maybe you don't want to necessarily hear is I really appreciate the Corona beer ad campaigns. I'll be honest, they, they, they always get me. This idea of just a, a quiet breeze and somebody sitting with a Corona, I don't even drink beer, but just the picture on the scenic beach is an amazing one. You can kind of just by drinking their drink, leave all of your troubles behind and be present on a secluded beach somewhere. To me, it sounds pretty amazing. Obviously, I'm not endorsing Corona here, but I like the idea of leaving things behind because you're focused on something different, something better. I was researching this week and that they've had that exact same ad campaign for the last 30 years. So obviously it touches on the human heart that desires what's next, what's on the other side of this. You see what Jesus points to is the fact that he's preparing something for the believer on the other side of all of this hardship, something that we're looking forward to. He's not telling us to just imagine that and pretend like we're not where we're at, but he's saying, keep your eyes on the prize. And I would suggest based, based on round one of his creation, that round two is gonna be pretty epic, pretty amazing. I'd say one of the things that gets us in trouble when he's saying preparing a place is I would say that whoever's in charge of marketing for heaven is doing a pretty lousy job. Think about some of the, the pictures or images that are propagated by current culture. What are, what are some of the things that come to mind for you guys when you think about heaven? What do we see often portrayed? Josh, Lindsay? Harps, harps yes, lots of harps. Cupid angels, Cupid angels yes. Floating on clouds, Charmin toilet paper, you know, uh, and really not even cool wings, like the little miniature wings that aren't going to do much for you. Little chubby babies in diapers, shooting arrows. You're like, man, that doesn't really sound that great to me. I was listening to a pastor this week that was saying really one of his life goals is to avoid those things, avoiding diapers and avoiding any kind of encounter with a harp. And really you think about that, you're like, that's not really the best portrayal. A better portrayal, more biblical portrayal is what is outlined in scripture. No crying or pain, no wars, no hunger, 
no cancer, no COVID, no sickness, no death, no physical boundaries. I, I like the idea of being able to fly, walk through walls, being able to, some even suggest transport like Jesus was known for doing, being reunited with believers, people that we love, children, how exciting that will be. Everything being brand new. Greatest part though, is being reunited with our maker, with Jesus forever, eternity. It's gonna be amazing, reigning and ruling with him. That's why 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, what no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Man, the point here wasn't necessarily the specifics about heaven, but rather it being a place to look forward to amidst current trials, our blessed hope, if you will. The other thing that he tells us in this section, not just that he's preparing a place for us, what else does he tell us? He's saying that he's coming again to take us there with him. I've noticed in present day culture, I don't know when the pendulum swung on this, but present day, it seems like anybody that talks about the return of Christ or him taking us up in the, a rapture is kind of seen as a little bit like, okay, cuckoo. But really, honestly, it's outlined throughout the New Testament. It's a reoccurring theme, and it's specifically talked about over and over again. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That was intended to be an encouragement because that day is coming. That day is coming most likely sooner than maybe some might think. My understanding of, of, uh, of prophecies about his return is really, uh, really most theologians agree that the timeline and the things that have needed to happen before his return have really completed. The last major event was in 1948 with Israel becoming a nation again that was unheard of, unbelievable, really. So at this point, at any moment, he could return. It could be now or now. It could be any moment. It's so exciting to think that it could be in our lifetime. I was hoping it would be so cool if he would have done it uh, right then. But either way, he promises to return and bring us to be present with him. And his promises are like, man, I, I wonder if it's gonna happen. It's kind of more like a pre-recorded game that you've watched. You've already seen the outcome. Anybody do this with sports, enjoy a game a little bit more because they know the outcome, but they kind of want to watch it just to see how it transpires. You like watching it live, right? But here's the idea is this is as sure as watching back a replay of the events. For us, it's a guarantee he's coming again and going to take us with him. So let's continue in the text, verse five. So the first area of focus was where we're headed. Second area of focus is how we get there. Verse five, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, famous verse, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You do not know where you, we do not know where you are going. Basically, you see that the disciples are still trying to piece all this together. They're trying to figure out how this all works. What's on the other side of this? Where Jesus is going? What's after the end of this life? Really, that's been an age old generational thing. People still wondering what happens when they die. 
Where will they spend eternity? Is it, is it blackness? Is it nothingness? Well, that's not a lot of hope. Is there life after death? Is there eternity in heaven? What is on the other side of this? The scripture is crystal clear that we're spending eternity in one of two places. And I think even our culture in their heart of hearts understands this themselves. I was working back in Chicago. I was working at a church called Harvest Bible Chapel. And my worship leader that I partnered with, he's really kind of the, the stereotypical, I hate to say this, what you'd think of a, a skinny jean wearing, 130 pound, uh, dark hair. And, uh, and so uh, he, was, he was that guy, the stereotypical worship leader uh, that you might picture flannel and skinny jeans. And, uh, and one day he was telling us the story. He was all frantic and out of breath. On his way to the church, the church was kind of close to kind of a little bit of a shady part of town where there's just a bunch of different homeless people. Someone had asked him for a ride to the train station. So he gave this gentleman a ride to the train station that he said was much larger than him. So he was kind of taking a bit of a risk. When they came to a stop at the train station, the homeless guy got him in a full headlock, true story, got him in a full headlock and said to him, if I kill you right now, do you think I'll go to hell? What in the world? Talk about an intense moment. Tony said that he, he was able to murmur the few words. He said, it's not if you kill me, it's whether or not you believe in Jesus that determines whether you go to hell. The guy released him and he came back to tell the story about what happened with this homeless man's uh, car ride. So in that, I don't know necessarily how that connects a little bit, but kind of a crazy story. You think about that so many times, people wonder what's on the other side, but people are hesitant for anybody to tell them that there's a specific way to get there. Have you noticed that? We're in a culture present day that's known for its moral relativism. Do you know that term, that whole idea of uh, my truth is determined by me, your truth is determined by you, truth is relative, and, uh, and we've, we hear that expression nowadays, you, you do you. In other words, you can go your own path, believe whatever you want, this whole idea of truth being relative to who we're dealing with. Really, if you think about that, that then creates a, a, a culture of tolerance. That's the popular word today, that if everybody's truth is their own truth, then you need to be sensitive to other people's truth and not step on any toes. But here's the problem, is where this tolerance kind of collides with real world. If I, if I take my, my, uh, my tolerant friend and punch him in the face, what would my tolerant friend say? Well, that, ouch, I would, I would think of, that was funny, Lindsay. Uh, but uh, my, my friend would say, that, that's like a jerk thing to do. You can't just go around punching people in the face. Well, I'd explain to him, that's, that's just how I greet people. That's how I express my love. Like, no, that wouldn't work. So really tolerance, set, try the same thing with stealing someone's wallet. We're not tolerant until, we're tolerant until it negatively affects us. So truth is we're surrounded with an intolerant form of tolerance. And really present day, as we progress in a, a culture of tolerance, Christians, anybody that claims a specific truth, the people have a hard time with that. That's why I would suggest that we're headed or on the precipice of persecution as the church under the name or umbrella of intolerance. But you think about it, most people would say that, that tolerance equals love, but I would say just the opposite as we see here. To intolerance actually represents love because the reality is not everybody can be right, especially with competing truth claims. Just think through that logically. If you have competing truth claims, they both can't be right. Somebody has got to be right. In this case, it also translates into what we believe about heaven and hell and what determines where someone is headed on the other side of this life. The truth is what Jesus said, he says, I'm the only way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
Is that an intolerant claim? Maybe, but tolerance shouldn't be elevated above someone's eternal destination. We get so concerned about that. You're like, oh, I want to be careful not to ruffle any feathers. But really, is potential offense more important than where someone's going to spend their eternity? If you genuinely believe that Jesus is what he claimed to be, the only way to heaven. Now you think about that, I'll use the illustration maybe you're familiar with, but imagine the conversation that you would have with a doctor if you found out that your life choices, your eating habits, your lack of exercise, whatever it might be, had led you to the place where you had a terminal illness. What would be some of the questions that you would ask the doctor? Think through that. Think through that conversation that you have. We were talking about this beforehand. What would be the conversations? What would be a question that you'd want to ask if you found out you were terminally ill? What do you guys think? Is there any other treatments? Is there any treatments? Is there something that that can be done? Now, what if the, the doctor says to you, amazing news for you. There is a treatment. What would be the next question you would ask about that treatment? What are your odds? What are, what are the chances of surviving? On the, what if you heard the doctor say, not only is there a treatment, it has a 100% success rate. Now, the practical side of us, the business-minded person would ask what? So what, how much does it cost, right? That's the, that's the next question. That's really the, the big question for a lot of us guys in medical bills. But you think about that if the doctor not only said, not only is there a way, it's secure, it's guaranteed, and it's completely free. You'd be like, no, there's got to be a catch. But if you heard all of those things, what insane person would say, well, there's got to be another way? Are you kidding me? That wouldn't make any sense. You would be thrilled that there was an option that was created that would had a 100% survival rate that was completely free. You're like, sign me up. That's really the heartbreaking thing. Really, I believe it's God's kindness that he didn't make it confusing for us. He just said, there's one simple path to me. It's through Jesus and that alone is your one way. So for us to keep focused on a couple things, keep focused on the eternal destination, but also to keep focused on what gets us there. So we're interacting. It's so easy to get distracted with the stupid things of this world, things that don't matter, that aren't lasting. For us to keep going back to, we hold within our hands, within our knowledge base, we hold the hope for someone's eternal destination. Continue on in verse 15. It says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, you'll notice that I jumped a little bit a couple verses ahead. He reiterated some of the truth in the verses leading up to this, but this gets us to the point of of the help that was left for these guys that were really feeling in a pretty desperate place. He describes what that kind of love relationship is intended to look like. I don't know for those of you that are married, if you've ever done any kind of a study on love languages with your spouse. I imagine at this point, it's a pretty popular theme. Spent some time trying to figure out what someone's love language is. It helps identify how they give and receive love. You'll notice I was talking with one couple a while back and they discovered that they had a tendency to love the other partner the way they wanted to be loved. That's kind of our natural tendency and they kind of were missing each other with that. 
But here's the, the cool thing. Well, my wife is a little bit confusing with all this because we go through the love language list and she's like, I like them all. Uh, to any one of them, I'll, I'll take any one. And so uh, I'm left with lots of options for Adrian. But here I, I love for us as we're trying to figure out what, when it says we're to have a, a personal relationship with God, you're like, well, what, is that, what does that actually look like? Jesus doesn't leave us guessing as to what this relationship in his absence is supposed to look like. He says it right there. If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. That's his love language. That's how we demonstrate our love and commitment to him. It's shown by obeying him. Then he says the response, it's a reciprocal thing. He's like, you follow my commandments and look at the response. Verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Kind of cool if you think about that. First off, the response, the reciprocal thing, when you demonstrate your love through obedience, he's like, man, I, I'll, I'll demonstrate my love for you by manifesting myself to you. What does that mean, manifest myself to you? It means I'll reveal more and more of myself to you. It's a reciprocal thing. I was talking to my daughter, Sienna, this week about what that looks like to go further or deeper in a relationship with Jesus That can be something that we throw around. You're like, oh, I just want to grow in my relationship with God. It's kind of vague. And I was talking to her about like what that actually looks like. What does that look like? It's it's a conversational thing is what I would suggest. Really, I would propose that the primary way that we develop a relationship with Jesus is getting more and more in tune with listening to his spirit's leading in our life. He prompts He nudges, he pushes you towards something and we respond with obedience. And here's how it snowballs. When we respond with obedience, then he gives us something else. And all of a sudden that voice that seemed kind of quiet in our lives starts to get louder. And that conversation starts to become more and more hearable uh, or audible to our ear because we have that kind of relationship where he begins to reveal himself by giving more and more for us, more nudges. That's the intention of a relationship. That is the Christian life. But here we notice in verse 21, it says to obey, you have to know his word. See, it says, whoever has my commandments and keeps them. That's one of the troubles that I would suggest with unfortunately too many believers present day. They don't necessarily know what his word says. That's one of the reasons why we gather around his word every week is to educate his, educate our conscience, to get so that we're familiar with things. I was talking with a group of my daughter's friends and we were, I forget how the conversation came up, but something came up with calling or referring to somebody as a fool. And I was like, I, I explained to him, I said, hey, did you know that there's a Bible verse that talks about that being a really bad thing? We're not intended to call somebody a fool. I ended up looking it up later, Matthew 5, 22, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. You're like, whoa. So obviously there's some context to that that we could unpack, but here the bigger idea is like, hey, God takes that pretty seriously, not to call somebody a fool. We have to choose our words wisely. Well, you could breeze through life if you didn't know God's word and never even know that. Call somebody a fool all the time. But here's the idea, is the more you educate yourself in God's word, it gives the ability for the Holy Spirit to communicate to you. And then when he communicates to you, and then you respond and say, okay, well, check that off the list. I'm not calling anybody a fool anymore. God's like, man, I like that obedience. That's how you express your love to me. It's a reciprocal thing. I'll reveal more to you and more and more of him as we follow that pattern. I love though in all of this, as I'm talking about the Holy Spirit is what he describes there is he says, He will leave us, he will give you another 
helper. And I just love that title for the Holy Spirit because when Jesus left, he didn't leave us as orphans, it says here. He left us with a helper. Anybody remember, anybody old enough to remember the days that we used to use these things that you call a roadmap? A roadmap. I we had these in Chicago back in the late '90s, and uh, really, the I was fairly new to driving. This is one that uh, Chad and Erica shared with me. It's called the Thomas Guide. Have you guys ever heard of that? That's a California thing, I guess. This is for the Los Angeles and Ventura counties. It shows you, and what it has is it has in this really specific maps with street addresses and roads and how to get places. And you used to, kids that are listening, this is how it used to work. You would actually open one of these, map out the route that you needed to get to get somewhere. Do you guys remember this? You guys are fairly young. <laughs> Look at Josh. Are you serious? You really don't remember doing that? Wow. Not a lot of mapping, but us older folks remember this. This was the way that you did everything. Then they introduced to us the cell phone that had GPS. It was like a whole new world. Don't you dare close your eyes. It was amazing. Sorry, I don't know where that came from. But here's the awesome thing about GPS is it would get more and more technical as it advances. Have you guys noticed this? Now you've got like the different apps. You've got Waze that gives you the best route. It talks about traffic. It talks, it even identifies through the network of people using it where cops are sitting. I've heard, not that I ever have to deal with that, but I've heard it's really helpful. And then the amazing thing, it doesn't just show you visually what to do. It also talks to you as you're driving. When you're getting closer, your right turn is coming up here. Anybody love this? Like it, it makes it pretty hard to mess up. And even when you do mess up, this is the cool thing about GPS. It then, do you love it when it says rerouting? When you've blown it, it's like, I'm giving you another chance, another direction. It would be silly to not utilize it. With all the technology that's there, it would be silly to say, you know what? I'm gonna skip this and I'm gonna go back to the old paper maps. That would be insane. Really, there's a lot of parallels. You can maybe see where I'm going with this. There's a lot of parallels to the Holy Spirit, to GPS. First off, he knows exactly where you're at. He's present. He says in, in this text that he dwells in you. So he's fully present. And the awesome thing is that he speaks to us directly. When you get that nudge that's saying, oh, don't say that, don't do that, or you shouldn't have had that tone with your wife, I've heard of people dealing with that before. And uh, he, he, he's the one that gives those nudges, those, those, those things. So he speaks to us. He gives us the best route to take. Man, you should skip this. You should definitely do that. He gets you back on course when you've blown it. He extends grace. I absolutely love that. It gets all of this through conviction. And in that, on the other side of walking in the Spirit, it would be insane to say, you know what? I'm just gonna go back to operating the flesh. I'm just gonna kind of navigate, wing it with my limited perspective, with my limited view on things. I'm just gonna do it on my own. So when he says, when he's saying, man, focus on your helper, focus on the provision of the Holy Spirit, man, I'll tell you what, that is the Christian life in a nutshell. When it talked, remember last week with Judas, it talked about him being that turned over where the enemy took over, where Satan came in and st started leading and directing his steps from there. Thinking about that this last week in a couple conversations, really, it's just the exact opposite extreme of what's intended for the life of a believer. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us possesses us, if you want to call it that, and we choose what degree we turn over the reins to him. The Christian life is to ultimately get to the place where you're like, you know what? It's not even me in control anymore. It's him. I've turned over the keys. He's the one driving, moving forward. Well, for us that parallel these disciples that are in the midst of chaos, hardship, confusion, 
lots of different messages coming at them. This is exactly what I would suggest we need to go back to. These things that free us from distraction, keeping focused on where we're headed, not getting caught up in the here and now, keeping your eye on the prize, knowing crystal clear how to get there and in route, making sure you're telling as many people as possible. And then lastly, as we just saw in the text, making sure that we're taking advantage and leaning into the resource, the ultimate resource, Christ himself living inside of us to direct us and nudge us appropriate. I'm so thankful for these helps for us going back to some of these simple things. The simple things, the simplicity of that is what takes all the weight of all the other chaos of this life off of our shoulders. Let me pray as we wrap up. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this text and we thank you for these reminders and really the charge that he gives to his disciples. Really, at a time that Jesus probably could have used some encouragement himself, he's busy encouraging his followers, encouraging them that they need to keep focused on the other side, the prize at the end of this, the blessed hope that we as believers each have. The reminder that he's the only way that he is good, he's faithful. The reminder that he hasn't abandoned us as orphans. He's left us with a helper. God, I pray that that gives us hope even in the week ahead, whatever we're dealing with, whatever circumstances, whatever mountain we're climbing, God, that that would be the hope that we cling to. We thank you for this text. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, Through every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress Oh, you are my portion You are my hiding place Oh, and I believe that you are The way, the truth, the life I believe
Thank you, worship team. And again, thank you for being a part of this service. If I could just have two more minutes of your time, I wanted to give you some uh, updates on what's happening here as a church as it relates to COVID. I've been encouraged over the last couple of weeks, maybe you've been tracking this as well, to see some of the COVID numbers in our in our country, in our state, in our area starting to go down. I get weekly updates from local hospitals as to where numbers are at. It's encouraging to continue to see those uh, go down actually uh, quite a bit. And so it's left us as a church asking questions about what does re-engagement look like? been really praying through that. And sometimes there's a hesitancy for people to start coming back because they're not quite sure what to expect. And one of the hardest things is not quite sure how people that they interact with are going to kind of ease them back into engagement. Well, we're at a place as we're racing towards Easter that we're starting to ask people to prayerfully consider what their re-entry looks like. Now, I understand that for some people with underlying health issues, with people that with uh, immune deficiency it's things and different things like that, it's, this is not intended to be a pressure thing. People have to come at their own pace at their own time. But for some of us, maybe the just one thing of, of that's kept us from re-entry is not quite sure what to expect. One of the things that we're going to trying to do starting next weekend, uh, next Sunday, to help ease people back into our outdoor gatherings is we're introducing the, a new system. It's kind of going to be a fun thing, I hope. I've heard of another church on the East Coast doing this and seeing some success with it. Is that at check-in, when people are coming down the walkway uh, to the church, is they have a t- we're going to have a table set up, and people for that day choose which sticker they're going to wear that day. I know it's not a kid's program, but this is the the idea, is you can choose one of three stickers. A red sticker would mean, hey, I'm just back. I'm still trying to ease into things. I'm wearing a mask. I'm preferring distance, not looking for a ton of interaction. The hope is, is that red sticker will help people understand, hey, kind of keep a little bit of hands off. A yellow sticker is another option. Yellow sticker sends the message that, hey, I'm actually a little more comfortable. I'm open to engaging, uh, but still keep a distance, uh, keep a mask up. That's kind of the idea of getting comfortable with that. And so that's a, another option of that. It's kind of like the uh, red, ye- red light, yellow light, and green light. The green light is the person that's gotten to a place, maybe somebody that has been uh, vaccinated or somebody that's uh, been on the other side of COVID or just in general, just more comfortable with it. They would wear a green sticker. And that person is sending the message, man, I'm open to talking, hug away, whatever. Uh, I've got this green uh, light for interaction. So that's one of the things that we're hoping to do to help kind of ease people back into being in our courtyard, still keeping some of the same systems in place, making sure we're social distancing. And definitely the outside has been an amazing factor. We've really had in our our nine months of being open, we've really had zero outbreaks here in the church. And we're so faithful for God's provision and protection for that. But just wanted to explain that to our online audience just to see what's happening and to ask or make the request for you to prayerfully consider what re-engagement looks like in your life. If you have any questions at all, any ways we can serve you, feel free to let me know. God bless you. Have an amazing week.